Hey viewers, before I start this video, I just want to notify everyone that I do have a Discord server where we discuss all horror and mystery related topics, so please join this awesome community and be part of the ramen army. Not only that, but you'll also be notified of all new upcoming content that will be uploaded on this channel, so you won't have to rely on YouTube to do so. Just make sure that when joining, that you read the rules and confirm by clicking on the thumbs up icon so you can fully enter the server. But please, do follow the rules for they're there for a good reason, and come chat with me and the other ramen. The link to the discord shall be in the description below. And with that said, let's get on to today's video. Some call them the lust killer, others call them the shoe fetish slayer. Whatever you prefer to call them, there have been very few men to walk this planet who match the notoriety of this cold-blooded killer. What you are about to watch is the story of one of America's most horrifying serial killers, a demon-possessed, bloodthirsty killer who terrorized Oregon between 1968 and 1969. This is the story of the necrophiliac murderer named Jerry Brudos. Brudos was born in Webster, South Dakota to a mother who at the time had hoped to give birth to a baby daughter. Unfortunately, baby Brudos arrived as a boy and as a result, his mother often ignored him and belittled him. This neglect sowed a seed of deep hatred for women in the heart of Jerry Brudos, a seed that would soon blossom into a dark and twisted quest for revenge against women, one that would have fatal consequences for his victims. His grooming started in his formative teenage years when he began stalking local women whom he would knock down and leave unconscious. What was rather odd about these criminal acts was that he would cart away with their shoes afterwards. Brudos had developed a twisted sexual fantasy, one that revolved around his hatred for women and a likeness for their shoes. These strong feelings would eventually define the life of Jerry Brudos. At age 17, Brudos was reported to have dug a hole in the ground and turned it into a habitation for girls whom he used as sex slaves. When the authorities discovered this, they arrested him and checked him in a psychiatric ward of Oregon State Hospital. Brudos spent a total of 9 months in this ward, and it was during his time there that his dark and twisted sexual fantasies were uncovered by the doctors. Brudos was able to return to a normal life afterwards. He graduated from high school, got a job as an electronics technician, and in 1961, he even got married and settled in Portland, Oregon, but his inner demons had not been vanquished. Underneath the exterior of what seemed to be a normal, easygoing man, the beast that had been suppressed for years was about to be unleashed. Not long after settling down with his wife in Portland, Oregon, Brudos began to complain of migraine headaches. He would occasionally suffer blackouts, according to him, but behind all these events, Brudos sought relief by returning to his dark arts. He would go out under the cover of the dark, robbing women of their shoes and stealing their night garments. This was the beginning of his descent into destruction. Jerry Brudos would eventually strangle and brutally murder four young women between 1968 and 1969. Initially, no one could trace the murders to Brudos. The police were only serviced with eyewitness reports who relayed that they had spotted a man dressed in women's clothing. Weird as it might have seemed, these reports were spot on. After brutally murdering his victims, Brudos would dress up in high heels and masturbate to their corpses. He would proceed to dismember his victims, cutting out their breasts and feet, all of which he kept as some sort of trophy. Who were the victims of Brudos? The first was Linda Slauson, age 19. She was last seen selling encyclopedias in a neighborhood in Portland, right where Brudos lived with his wife, Ralphine, and his two kids. Slauson inexplicably disappeared with her body never recovered. Brudos had killed her and thrown her body into the Willamette River right from the Wilsonville Bridge. Jan Whitney, age 23, was yet another victim of Brudos. Just like Linda Slauson, Whitney suddenly disappeared. Her car was later found empty and abandoned at a rest stop between Salem and Albany. Karen Sprinkler, age 19 at the time of her disappearance, was last seen in person in the Mirror and Frank parking lot in downtown Salem. She too was killed by Brudos. The last of his victims was Linda Saley, whose body was found in the Long Tom River near Monroe. Her body was found weighted down. She was killed by Brudos yet again. Jerry Brudos almost successfully abducted a then 15-year-old Gloria Jean Smith. Brudos grabbed a hold of Smith while she was walking near Parrish Middle School. He dragged her towards a green Volkswagen Carmon Gia. Luckily for Smith, 
she spotted a certain Phyllis Kerr who was working at a front yard close by. Smith cried for help as Kerr came to her rescue, pulling Smith away from the deranged Brutos. Smith would eventually play a role in identifying Brutos as the man who attempted to abduct her. Jerry Brutos usually lured these women or forcefully kidnapped them. Oftentimes, he captured them wearing a uniform and a badge. He would then take them to his garage where he would strangle them within the hour. But that was the least gory part of what he did to his victims. What you're about to hear might give you nightmares, so be warned. In very disturbing acts, Brutos would take his camera and capture the lifeless bodies of his victims. He would then dress them in lingerie and have sex with their lifeless bodies, filming the whole ordeal. Afterwards, he would cut their body parts, particularly their feet. He would then adorn these dismembered feet with shoes from his collection of stolen high heel shoes. Once he was done with the bodies, he would then dump them in the Long Tom River, an act which would eventually turn out to be the smoking gun that helps the police catch this gruesome killer. In May 1969, the police were finally on to Brutos. The bodies of two of his victims, Karen Sprinkler and Linda Saley, were found weighted down with old automobile parts in the Long Tom River. But the nail in the coffin for Brutos was when a 12-year-old girl identified Brutos from a photo lineup provided by the police. She pointed Brutos out as the man who had attempted to kidnap her, and so the dots began to align. On May 26, 1969, Brutos' home was searched by the police. What they discovered was investigative gold. The police found a roll of copper wire, some ropes, and most importantly, the pictures of all his victims. Just before Memorial Day weekend, Jerry Brutos was arrested by the police on a charge of armed assault related to the Gloria Smith in an incident that took place on April 22nd. On the 3rd of June 1969, Jerry Brutos was further charged with the murder of Karen Sprinkler, Linda Saley, and Jan Whitney. At the time of his arrest, Brutos did not confess to his crimes, rather he maintained innocence. Many of his friends who thought they knew him described Brutos as a devoted family man, a man who never so much as spoke a single profane word or even took a drop of alcohol for that matter, but it was all a facade. The police had seen all they needed to see. The man was a despicable human being who had no place in society. In their search for his apartment, the police had uncovered photos of both nude and clothed women. The clothes of women were also found in his house alongside a list of women's names, addresses, and phone numbers, possibly potential targets. The police also discovered several notes that Brutos had made on all the sororities and women's living organizations at Oregon State. In fact, some of the women found on the list spoke with the police and revealed that they had received caps from a certain man who claimed to be a Vietnam veteran who was lonely and needed company. Some of the women admitted to have even dated the man. The evidence was all too clear against Jerry Brutos. It was the end of the road for him. It was not long before Brutos succumbed and changed to a guilty plea. Jerry Brutos confessed to have killed all three of the women he accused of killing. He made this confession just three days before he was to go to trial. Brutos confessed in detail of how he approached these women, strangled them to death and mutilated their bodies and dumped them in the river. Brutos would later go on to confess to a fourth murder, the murder of Linda Slauson. He told a psychiatrist how he killed Linda, who he found selling encyclopedias from door to door. Linda's body was never found and despite his admission, Brutos could not be convicted for her death as there was lack of sufficient evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he had killed Miss Lawson. Nevertheless, Judge Val Slopper handed Jerry Brutos three consecutive life sentences, one for each murder count brought against him. Following the judgment, Brutos was immediately transferred to Oregon State Penitentiary to begin his life sentences. During his incarceration, Brutos retained a collection of women's shoes in his cell. He wrote many companies to ask for a supply of these shoes, claiming that they served as a substitute to pornography for him. As is the case for many life sentences, Jerry Brutos and his legal counsel sought to appeal for parole. They also lodged countless appeals against his sentencing. In one appeal, Brutos alleged that the existence of a photograph of him and the corpse of one of his victims was not enough evidence to prove that he was guilty of murdering the victim. Such weak arguments were ultimately unsuccessful. But where he failed at overturning his senses, he continued to press for parole. In 2005, at which point he was the longest serving inmate in Oregon, Brutos told the parole board that he felt more mentally stable having submitted himself to counseling for years. In his appeal in 2005, Brutos informed the parole board that he was recovering from colon cancer. At that time, Brutos was also pursuing a master's degree in counseling at the Oregon State Penitentiary. 
In his appeal, Brutos claimed to have mellowed with age. He cited an incident where he had recently walked away from a prison altercation, something which, according to him, he would have never done in the past. Yet, when the board pressed Brutos to divulge the motivation behind the heinous crimes he committed, Brutos was not forthcoming. Because the board couldn't identify a motive, they were hesitant to put him back into society. They knew that the most dangerous killers are the ones who kill without a clear motive. As a result, in 2005, the parole board voted to ban Brutos from ever being able to get parole. Brutos was only being interviewed every two years by the parole board to gain an idea into his state of mind. On March 28, 2006, Jerry Brutos was confirmed dead at 5.10 a.m. at the age of 67. Brutos died at the Oregon State Penitentiary's infirmary. A relative of Brutos had revealed to the press that Brutos suffered from liver cancer. At the time of his death, he was the longest serving inmate in all of Oregon State Penitentiary. According to James Stovall, the Salem detective who was responsible for bringing down Brutos, he described Brutos as, quote, one of the true monsters of the United States or the world perhaps, end quote. That is a submission that is difficult to argue against. The horrifying things that Brutos did in his time were too despicable to be said in some arenas. He was a man truly sick in the mind. His story will be studied for years to come in law enforcement texts and true crime books. His name will forever be etched in infamy as the quote, shoe fetish slayer, end quote. Despite his less than ideal upbringing, we may never know what drove Jerry Brutos to the dark side, a place of insanity and sheer wickedness. He was a living nightmare, a horror tale, a despicable human being, kind we hope to never come across again. For more chilling stories like this, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the bell notification so you never miss an upload. Stay safe out there, the shoe fetish slayer might be on the hunt.